Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Lit RPG Podcast, episode number 38. I'm Ramon Mia, I'm here to bring you the latest Lit RPG news, reviews, and of course, author interviews. Uh, now, you can actually get individually written reviews of each of the titles from this podcast on our Facebook page at facebook.com, litrpgpodcast.com. Uh, the new releases and reviews that I'll be talking about this week are Sufficiently Advanced Magic, Arcane Ascension Book 1, Project Phoenix number two, Lightspeed. Also, The Dungeon's Child, which is the third book in the Slime Dungeon Chronicles. For the Guild, third book in the Emerilia series, The Crystal Sphere, and also World Seed Expansion. And then Reborns book 13 and 14. Uh, Reborn 13 is called Demon's Trap Reborns. 14 book in that series is Demon's Return. On to Little RPG News. <laughs> Now, um, unfortunately, there's not going to be really a Lit RPG News section this week. There are so many um, books that I'm reviewing eight this week. Um, so I'll be skipping the Lit RPG News section. But I do want to mention the Lit RPG that came out this week on Amazon um, that I just couldn't review or read um, this week in addition to the other eight books. Uh, but they are going to be on the schedule for next week's episode. Uh, so out now, but we'll review next week The Way the Clan, Book 6, uh, Zekdos, Volume Six as well, uh, Raven's Croc Conspiracy, Tactical Fantasia, back in the game, and The Glitch Fiends. Uh, additionally, I'll be reviewing the fourth book in the Realm of Archon series, Shadows of the Great Forest. Now, uh, I'm also going to be skipping the upcoming Lit RPG list. It's, it's long. It's still going to be in the show notes for this episode of the podcast. You can also catch it on our um, website, uh, geekbypockets.com. But also, of course, on the Facebook page for this particular podcast, which I've given you the address for. It's the pin post at the top if you want to check it out. On to the uh, re new releases and the reviews. Okay, new releases and reviews. Going to begin with Sufficiently Advanced Magic by Andrew Rowe. Uh, this is the first book in the Arcane Ascension series. Um, now, real quick... Um, I mentioned last week that I wasn't sure if this was a little RPG, so I was just going to give a, a read to see if it was. And the short version of this is that it's not a little RPG, so it's not going to be a review. It's a really nice series, um, book I should say. It's a nice tower exploration story, which is like dungeon diving only in a tower going up. Um, then there's a magical academy story attached after that. Um, I have nothing negative to say about it. It's, it's fun and it's interesting. Uh, reminds me a little bit of um, Harry Potter-ish, but with different kind of magic school system in the Magical Academy portion of it. Again, the, the author didn't claim to be a little RPG. Um, I, I know just a few people wondering if it was or not, and it's not. So there you go. Even though it does show up in the group, um, when you search for little RPG, it's on that list on Amazon, but it's not actually. So there you go. But again, I enjoyed it. Also, uh, talking about Project Phoenix number two, Lightspeed. Uh, this one does label itself as a lit RPG series. It is written by N.A.K. Baldrin. Um, I reviewed the first um, episode in this serial story. Um, uh, my opinion, it's 41 pages, $1.49. It's available on Kindle Limited. It's very reasonably priced for the amount of pages that you're getting for it. Uh, so no complaints there. The basic premise of this series so far has been that uh, a, a man named Jack is kidnapped by a government agency and forced to play a space simulation full immersion virtual reality game. He unfortunately chose to spawn on a very far space station instead of in the noob zone. So he's uh, he's a little out of his depth, unfortunately, and he goes on a couple of different ventures in each one of these episodes. Now, again, uh, a really easy review because this is not Letter PG either. Uh, unfortunately, this one does claim to be Lit RPG, and I, this is essentially the same review I gave episode one in last week's episode. It's more sci-fi with the trapped in a game, uh, trapped in a VR game kind of theme. Unfortunately, it still gets a four out of ten because it's not Lit RPG, even though it says it is. Uh, no game mechanics, uh, no skill progressions, no no kind of character progression according to those game mechanics that are obviously stated. So it doesn't even, doesn't quite qualify as Lit RPG at all. Um, so four out of ten is my review rating for it. And I'll be dropping this serial from this review schedule. So, sorry, I gave it two books. 
um, hasn't got any more lit RPG ish. So there you go. Okay, on to a story that was really quite nice. Uh, the Dungeon's Child, The Slime Dungeon Chronicles, Book 3, written by Jeffrey Falcon Luke. Um, have, I've had a chance to talk to Jeffrey. Uh, we have an interview on the website if you want to go check it out. It's real fun. It is uh, 283 pages, $4.49, available on Kindle Unlimited. Uh, now, as the Dungeon Tower town rather, recovers from the attack of the Undead Dungeon, Doc and Claire improve the dungeon itself and create new traps and monsters for adventures to try and conquer. In the meantime, malevolent forces outside the city put their plans into motion. Dun dun dun! Yeah, no, this is actually a really fun story. Um, there were some criticisms of book two in the reviews for it on Amazon. I'll get to that in a minute, but one of the biggest improvements of this story over book two was that it's a lot more succinct. I got all the parts of the story that I love in this series. The dungeon part, the dungeon creation, creating creature evolutions, new traps, new levels made by Doc and Claire. Those are all the things that I personally just enjoy because they're different from other action oriented or just adventure stories or questing stories, whatever the case is. The thing that sets this apart is the dungeon portion of it. And that's the part that I really love learning about the best uh, or, or the most rather. And again, one of the more common complaints in book two was that there was too much time spent uh, outside of the dungeon in the dungeon town. Like, just too much time with a bunch of other characters that didn't really have anything to do directly with the dungeon. And even I kind of made that criticism. Uh, but that has been completely reversed in book three. Uh, a lot more time is spent in the dungeon itself. So that's a, that's a, that's a big plus for me. I'd say the ratio of... Uh, Dungeon time to outside time is about 70-30, 70% is spent in the dungeon. So that, that's a big improvement. I, I, I like that. Um, there's, again, tons of great action in the story. Um, and the advan uh, author advances the plot of the larger world. So even though he does go outside the dungeon for that 30%, it's really important time. Um, like the, There's the big, you know, scary um, outside influences trying to influence that dungeon town. That are described and i don't want to spoil anything but it's it's really well done so good job uh, also there is a new dungeon character um, who allows doc a view of the outside world and it's a really good choice by the author since we get commentary from doc and claire as this character explores the dungeon town i thought it was a unique opportunity or a good a, a good story uh, choice to as a way of letting doc and claire explore the outside world without actually having to leave the dungeon themselves and they can see and experience the world through this new um, dungeon character, which everyone's well. Um, but again, really good story. A lot of the threads from books one and two, as far as like the larger world, are coming together in book three. Uh, and it, 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 it's a good story. I liked it a lot. Uh, it gets an eight out of ten from me. Easy. So good recommendation. Okay, on to For the Guild and Marilia book three, written by Michael Chatfield. It is uh, 440 pages. $4.99. It is available on Kindle Unlimited. Now, uh, Dave, our main character in the Stone Raiders, actually get a unique quest to help restore the homes of a feared techno race, the Aleph. At least they're feared by the Pantheon. Uh, now, before the release back into Emerilia. Um, however, in addition to the challenge, that challenge, the guild is also being targeted by um, the Player Killer Guild, who are out to make a name for themselves by killing the Stone Raiders. Now this is a little bit of the player versus player aspect of this um, VR game that's not really a VR game. Okay, um, some of the things I really liked about the story, again, I like this series in general, it's really good. And the author puts out like 400, 500 page books on a monthly basis, so I'm already, already impressed with it. But some of the things that stood out for me as being particularly cool and interesting, um, Dave gets a class, He's been classless this entire time. Um, he's finally spending some of those stats points he's been hoarding uh, since book one, as he, and he gets to level 10 finally. Uh, there's more crafting, more fighting, all things that I like. We also get our first glimpse into the larger universe outside of Emerilia, as Dave made contacts with the humans who were in hiding throughout the galaxy. Really cool. I also like the Elif, um facilities that are introduced. Um, they do some dungeon helping to help clear them out to, to make them uh, a place for the elect to live when they are un 
Frozen or wherever they happen to be. Um, I like the book. I always like it. Uh, really high quality, um, good standard of writing, very few spelling errors that I could ever find, like one or two in the entire 400 pages. Um, so I give For the Guild um, 8 out of 10. Okay, on to uh, Goblin, a lit RPG novel in the Towers of Gates lit RPG series book one. Yes, it's one of those long titles. Written by Paul Bellow. Okay, uh, it is about 500-ish pages. This is a little difficult because at the time of this writing, um, Amazon does not actually have a page number listing for this particular title. Um, but by my estimate, it's roughly 500, 550 pages. It is 99 cents, however, so that's an, a really good price for that number of pages. It's not a small book. It is also available on Kindle Unlimited. So that's definitely a point in its favor. Um, now, as I was reading this story, there were, there were quite a few thoughts uh, that came through my mind. It, it, it's pretty well written, at least the beginning portion. Like the very first chapter is, it's, 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 what, it's great. I, I really like the first chapter. It drew me in. Um, the first chapter tells the story of, 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 of three kids logging to a forbidden VR game. One of them is Eric, who's a wheelchair-bound kid. Um, who gets full use of his limbs back in the game that he's logging into. Uh, Sarah is his best friend and the girl that he's secretly in love with. And Josh is a jock that's uh, Sarah's boyfriend. And he's really only there because his girlfriend is. Um, the first chapter to me shows a lot of the potential for the story that could have been. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't pan out. And that's kind of disappointing to me because the first chapter, if you read it by itself, has a standalone short story or whatever. You can see them think, oh, that's there's a lot of great storytelling potential opportunities. Like when I read it, I thought, okay, you can explore a bunch of emotional complexities about um, the main character regaining the use of his legs. Um, do they actually work in the game if his brain doesn't have a neurological uh, a, a, a connection uh, through the nerve endings to his legs still? Would they actually work? Um, is there going to be a psychological addiction for the character going in and out of the game? Um, or even cooler, uh, as a possible storyline, can he get the regain the use of his legs in the real world because he's using them in the game? You know, or for the love interest, uh, there are a ton of great potential storylines, and just none of them were explored. And so maybe that's part of why uh, I gave the review what I did because it, it felt a little disappointing because those are cool ideas that were just never explored, but they were kind of teased in that very first cool chapter. Uh, now, one of the things I thought could have been done better, of course is the love interest. Um, the first couple times that, that Eric um, kind of groans that Sarah in the game is flirting with non-player characters, he, he complains, oh, why didn't she know that she, I love her? Can she tell that I care for her, that I, that I, that I feel this way? How can she do this to me? Um, it's cute the first time. Um, unrequited love. You know, who, who can't relate to that? Um, but, you know, the ninth and tenth time, when he's basically feeling jealous about... Um, his friend flirting with non-player characters or just good-looking guys, you know, it's it gets a little more um, jealousy possessive-ish, um, which is not particularly attractive. And on, on the flip side as well, she's, you know, she, there, you know, there are issues there with both sides of that love issue, and it kind of feels forced at the very end, you know, putting them together. Um, again, there are real life issues that could have been explored within this virtual reality story, and just. You know, those emotional connections and storylines were never developed. And that seems, again, like a waste of potential to me. But again, there are some other things that I did really like about the story. Um, Two-ish things that I thought were kind of cool. One is the there's a penalty in the story for speaking out of character. Uh, it's actually a 10% of your next XP uh, is lost per infraction. So um, role players in... Um, on role-playing servers or in tabletop games, um, sometimes they're, you want to talk out of character, which means like game stuff. Um, when you're talking in character, that's like you role-playing, you're, you're actually thinking in your brain the things that your fantasy character would say within that, the context of that world, which, which usually means you don't say game stuff. Um, and I thought it was kind of a cool way in this world of kind of enforcing that by creating an XP penalty. C cool idea. Um, eventually it goes away and it's not always implemented with throughout the story and eventually I think the, even the author got tired of, of, of showing the penalty because he gives them a magic stick that eliminates the penalty entirely uh, so that was 
but I, I think it's a cool idea. Additionally, uh, the action scenes in the story are well written, descriptive, um, creative tactics are used to do with some of the more powerful enemies, so really good action scenes. Um, unfortunately, they don't save the story in my opinion. Um, there are a lot of other things that I didn't care for in the story uh, that totally dropped the, the score for me. Um, one, characters in the story have a ton of foreknowledge they shouldn't have. They, have, they know things that contextually they should not know. Um, for example, the jock character who just goes in because of his girlfriend. He says he doesn't play these kind of games, and yet he magically knows how to use a bunch of game skills like Barbarian Rage um, within the story of comics. So he, he has information he doesn't have. He shouldn't. Additionally, the characters in the story when they're talking to each other or just you know thinking about things, they know more about the game's lore and game mechanics than they should because this is the first time they've ever played this game. And so how do they know how all these things work? Like some of it, you can be like, okay, I've played other video games. I'm guessing that this is how this works, but that's not how it's stated. They're stated as facts. Like, oh, this is how the game works. And it always makes me wonder, like, how do you know that? You've never played this before. Um, so that kind of bugged me sometimes. And additionally, there's a couple other incidents where they just know things that happen in the story that they weren't there for. Like, they know things that happen from someone else's perspective, you know, in some other place. Like, they just magically know it. Like, when... Um, when characters or, or people die, like the some other character we refer to, and like, hey, you weren't there for that. How do you know that? Um, so that kind of bugged me as well. Now, additionally, um, a big part of the story is um, there's a evil bad guy who's introduced very early in the story. So this isn't a spoiler. Uh, named Inyan Inyantu, uh, I N Y O N T O O, who uh, is just killing these characters, um, noobs that come into the game essentially. But it's not explained to like the story is already halfway over why he does it. He's just a mysterious figure who just decides to kill these characters according to their perspective. Um, and it, I think that's a little bit long to, to kind of address who your villain is and why he's just doing this kind of stuff. Um, also, uh, the story is told from a first person perspective, but it's a multiple perspective narrative. Um, so it's told from each one of those three characters perspective um, and the chapters kind of rotate. So for one chapter, it'll be Eric's first-person point of view. Then the next one, it will be the, the girl character, uh, Sarah. And then the next chapter, it'll be like Josh's perspective in the first person. So, um, and that gets very confusing very quickly from a lot of the story. I found myself like, who is speaking right now? Um, because from the first-person perspective, they say, I, every single time. They're not identifying themselves by name. Um, and you get clues, okay, it's when they start referencing other people, um, but it, 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 it's, it's unusually and unnecessary confusing, especially after like the first few chapters, um, two of the characters, Eric and Sarah, are together all of the time. So there's no need for separate perspectives. Like it doesn't need to shift from Eric to Sarah back and forth. Um, you could have just stuck with one of those people and told a story and it would have been a lot less confusing. So I, I don't think that that particular narrative style worked in this particular instance to just cause unnecessary confusion. And a lot of time between those chapters, when you're switching perspectives, their attitudes shift as well. Like in one perspective, um, like Eric would be angry and angsty. Um, and then when you shift to Sarah's perspective, magically, she's also angry and angsty. Like that attitude from Eric shifted with, to the other perspective. And again, it causes some confusion, at least for me. Um, some of the quests the characters go under, they're interesting, and they help compartmentalize the story a little bit, but unfortunately they also will get twisted, they get plot twisted to death about the 40% mark, um, and it kind of ruins all the progress that they made. It becomes a little bit unbelievable. For example, um, there's about to destroy an evil artifact, and then a bad guy just happens to show up and steal it away, I'm like, how did that bad guy know where to find them? And again, it's, it's just one of those things. Um, one of the other last things that I thought was really just, I didn't care for, uh, was the fact that it took us about over half the novel to address why the players are stuck in the game and how that there are other players stuck besides those three characters. Um, and that's, that's hundreds and hundreds of pages, um, that have been spent before addressing that big concern. I thought that was a little bit too long to address that really big, important storyline.
Um, now, to be fair, the last 50% of the novel is a bit better, and there are fewer perspective shifts, but there are also some really odd plot twists. Um, and while there are a few interesting game mechanics in the story, and I saw a lot of potential, it never pans out, and I really had to push myself to finish the novel at all. Um, and just from my perspective, if if I can eliminate like over 50% of the novel and it doesn't really seem to affect the story, that's kind of a problem. And that's kind of what I, the conclusion that I came to as I was finishing sort of like, I felt like a lot of it was unnecessary because it ultimately didn't further the plot and became a little repetitive. Um, you could literally skip from like 10% mark all the way to the 50% mark in this story and you wouldn't really lose anything. So there you go. Um, this I give Goblin, a lit RPG novel, a 4 out of 10. Can't recommend it, unfortunately. Um, hopefully it improves in the next book, if the author decides to write it. So that's my review. Okay. On to Soulstone, Skeleton King, World of Rule, book 2. Uh, written by J.A. Cipriano. Okay. This is the second book in the series, and again... Uh, same kind of page number issue. I estimate it to be about 559 pages. It could be less or more. Amazon, at the, the time of this recording, hasn't given a page number listing for the book. It is, though, $5.99. It is available on Kindle Unlimited. Uh, now, full disclosure, I got an advanced review copy for the book. I have since picked it up on Kindle Unlimited. Okay, um, short version of plot summary-ish. Um, Aaron is the main character. He was kidnapped. Um, his brain was distracted in book one, and he's forced to play in this um, video game, virtual reality video game. Um, unfortunately, the the bigger plot line is that if they can't conquer and can't, you know, basically pick up all the soul stones in the video game and collect them all uh, before a certain t amount of time elapses, the world's going to go to a, a computer apocalypse. Uh, that's kind of the, kind of the the big overall arcing story for book one. In book two, uh, Aaron and his group of buddies are still stuck in the virtual world of rule, where if they die in the game, they die in real life, or at least what's left of them, they're just brains at this point. Now, um, there is a uh, kind of a side story that happens for most of the story where they have to collect all the pieces of the one weapon that can defeat the Skeleton King. Um, so that's mostly what the story is going to be about. And it's really pretty good, actually, uh, some of it. Uh, well, I'll get into that. Um, I consider this the undead DLC package for Stolestone. It's definitely undead themed, most of the story. And especially in the beginning, it felt like the author wrote this while binge watching The Evil Dead, or maybe The Walking Dead, since the Skeleton King's real name is Prince Flynn. Uh, so there's a ton of undead stuff happening here. Um, the Skeleton King. Um, has some of the same issues that Soulstone Awakening, which is the first book in the series, has. Um, you can read my review at geekbyspodcast.com on the Bullet RPG section if you want to read it for book one. But these are the issues that still continue to uh, occur within the second book as well. Uh, one, I don't really care about most of the characters. I mean, with the exception of George, the snack talking around it, who's pretty awesome, uh, most of the characters just aren't there's no emotional connection for me. I mean, the author tries to do that a little bit more here uh, in, in book two. But for most of the characters, I'm like, I don't care if they die or not. Uh, and that's probably going to be a problem. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't want them to die necessarily in the story, but I wouldn't like be emotionally devastated or have any kind of feeling if one of them happened to kick the bucket. Uh, and I think that's an issue because if you can't care about the characters, you're not really that interested in the story. Um, there are also game mechanic issues which I talked about in the first book, where the characters can kind of pull a Neo in the Matrix kind of thing happening, where they can bend the rules of the world um, and get the exact power or ability that they need to overcome a certain situation. But I have to say, this happens a lot less in this book than it did in, in, in book one. Like in book one, it happened way too much. And it, it was kind of an issue for me. Um, in this book, it happens once or twice, which is not a big deal. But one of the bigger examples of this is that um, Aaron, the main character, who's been a rogue the entire time in book one, you know, is dual wielding daggers, has a, a two-handed, you know, sickle, or a sith. Um, and in book two, in the middle of a fight, he actually switches classes from being a rogue to being a necromancer build. Um, 
right in the middle of battle, he just switches a bunch of powers. He basically creates all the necromancer powers and, and adopts them. And I'm like, that seems a little OP, a little overpowered to me. But again, it's one of those examples where the characters have the ability, and this is totally valid within the story, um, to bend the rules of the game and grab powers from that they've made up or that exist in other video games. And this is just one of the examples. But again, thankfully, it only happens a couple times in the entirety of the story. So that's definitely an improvement from my point of view, where the author is is keeping a little more to the game rules and forcing the characters to to work within those boundaries a bit more. There's still a couple of, of you know instances where it's like, oh, here's a magic ability to get out of the situation I created, but they're much fewer. Okay, um, new character. There's a new character in the story called Sabre. Uh, S-A-B-R-E, Saber, um, who got frozen in the game in 1982, and she's actually a really interesting addition to the cast. You're not really sure if she's a good guy, bad guy yet, um, but she, you know, she's still really cool. So it, it's interesting to see the different perspective that the author created between someone who was a gamer in the 80s and someone who's a gamer now, although occasionally the author will slip up and give her a few slang phrases that she probably wouldn't have had in the 80s if she was frozen in time in 1982, but... It's, there are not too many of those examples, but it's an interesting character. Now, uh, one of the best parts of the story happens very late in the novel. About the 65% mark, the story takes a turn as the beginning scene prepares to defend itself from the undead king and his horde. The story takes a Warcraft-style resource-gathering, real-time strategy turn, um, which is really cool. So if you ever played Starcraft or the original Warcraft 1, 2, or 3, you'll understand the type of, of base building, um, resource gathering, um, real-time strategy situation that's occurring. Um, and it's really cool. This is probably my favorite part of the story because Aaron, who's again the main character, a uh, rogue term necromancer, becomes the mayor of this big gaming town and he gets to direct the citizens to gather and manage resources. He also gets to decide on what buildings to make, um, what type of walls to build, how much uh, resources he's gonna spend it, and how to kind of manage the balance between getting resources and also building, and he even gets to recruit new uh, new laborers. He gets to tell crafters what to make, so you get some crafting stuff in there, and uh, it, it's all really cool. I like this particular expansion of the story because it, it created something new for me to enjoy and experience, and it just wasn't uh, kill, kill, kill stuff, collect things, collect things, and you know whatever. That part um, was not as interesting as that last third of the story. I, I wish. I could have gotten there a little bit sooner and maybe expanded upon it because it's really interesting and I like that the best about it. And I'll be honest, um, those elements basically saved the novel for me. Like up until then, it just wasn't working for me. I was probably going to give it like a five or six out of ten. Um, but those real-time strategy elements just added, injected so much new information and so many cool game mechanics and the author stuck to them 100% consistently um, that it bumped it up to a 7 out of 10 for me. So I really like I, I like that th last third a lot. The first, you know, 65%, it's okay, it's not bad. It's just, like, I read this story, basically, in book one. Um, and even though it was improved, it just wasn't, like, a ton improved. But with the addition of the real-time strategy stuff, I'm like, oh, yeah, this is better. Good job. Uh, so, you know, Soulstone Skeleton King gets a 7 out of 10 for me. Okay. On to The Crystal Sphere, uh, the narrow book, letter PG series, uh, written by A. Levin. Uh, now, this is from the same author as the Phantom Server series. Now, um, in the book description, it's it's called a prequel, but I, I kind of consider it a standalone novel set in the same universe um, as the Phantom Server series, even though they're very different games. Um, it's sent in the same kind of techno universe um but we'll get to that in a minute it is 286 pages although i think that might be a little short changing it it is also three dollars and 89 cents it is available on kindle limited i also got an advanced copy of this one to review um but i went picked it up on kindle limited so you know no conflict of interest there uh again this is if you haven't read the phantom server series you don't need to read it to enjoy the story like if you if you've read the phantom server series you're probably going to giggle at some of the references like, oh, I remember that. Or you'd be like, oh, I see what that's connecting to that other story. Um, but you don't need to have read the Phantom Server series to enjoy this novel. It's really good just on its own. And again, it's set, um, I'm not sure how far in, uh, 
before it's not before the Phantom Service series, but, but people are just moving into the mega cities in this book. Um, that's kind of talked about in the very few, uh, first couple chapters of real world life. So you know definitely that it's it's set before all that um, all that occurs in the Phantom Service series. Uh, now the main character is Alexitus. He's the one of the first test subjects for a revolutionary new neural interface. You'll have to live in a fantasy virtual reality game called The Crystal Sphere. Uh, as its first immersion, full immersion player and learn how to survive when he's one of the only players that can actually feel pain in the game. Now, uh, most of the story focuses on, on that main character, learning about the game world, how it works, his unique class um, of, of Neuro, which is tied to his Neuro Implant, and kind of gives him some really amazing abilities and skills um, if he can master them. Um, you learn about these more about the 30% mark, most of that earlier portion of the 30% is um, real world stuff, real world stuff, how he gets into the game, um, a bunch of backstory, introduction to the game world, that kind of stuff. I'm not going to spoil any of the cool abilities. Uh, a few of them might kind of be a little overpowered, but it's really f still fun to read about and think about um, the kind of character you would build in this world, for me anyways. There are a few translation errors, um, but it's nothing so big that it would break the immersion. Um, there's also... Later on in the story, some um, town building mechanics. Um, there's plenty of dungeon delving here, even some crafting, and surprisingly, um, some trade stuff, like economics. Um, so I, I was pleasantly surprised to have such a variety of, of things to read, and they're all game-related stuff, um, and I, I thought it was really cool. So that's that's my opinion of it. There's still, of course, the, you know, uh, carried over technophobia, techno concerns, um, stuff that's presented. So again, uh, it's a really good book. I enjoyed it. It gets a 7 out of 10 for me. Okay, on to World Seed Expansion. This is the third book in that series from Justin Miller. Um, nice guy. I actually had a chance to do a Q&A, written Q&A with him um, in December um, in uh, 2016. You can read about it at geekbyspodcast.com. It's on the front page. Okay, um, this book is a whopping 620 pages. That's right, folks. Um, you can actually put several of the other novels together and it still wouldn't be this long. It is $3.99. It is not available on Kindle Unlimited, and that's because the author also provides um, this story on the World Road. It, it's a big point for him that he wants to keep those people who supported him, give them the option to read it for free, and then, of course, purchase this if they want to support him financially. Um, so it's a really big issue for him, so I understand why he does it. Uh, but it is not available on Kindle Unlimited. But to me, it's well worth the price. I mean, this is literally half a cent per page, uh, about-ish. But it's 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 a great value to me and a really great story. Okay, if you've read the other books in this series, um, I'm not sure how much to say without spoiling the series because it's a really good series and I don't want to spoil anything. Okay, so we'll just say it this way. Um, the secret about the game is out. And John, the main character, has created a spaceship with the help of his AI companion to save as many people as he can in the galaxy before the Earth becomes the most notorious dungeon ever. Um, join John on his journey through space as the first space druid. That's right. Uh, as he explores the galaxy. He actually visits some other um, alien races and advances their culture. Um, th there's definitely a time travel element to the story, which is kind of cool. Um, but I would recommend, you, you sort of have to read books one and two first before you get to book three. Otherwise, things aren't going to make a lot of sense because there's a lot of tiny wimey stuff happening. Um, uh, but it, it all makes sense if you read the other two books. So I definitely would recommend going and getting those. They're really cool as well. I, uh, there is a little bit of a harem stuff um, in the storyline, but it's it's not graphic. It's just, okay, he has a bunch of girlfriends. So, But if you're not into that... Um, I'm just letting you know now that it, it, that it is there. But I'm a huge fan of this series. It's a really interesting story. There's crafting. There's a huge, amazing skill system that's really robust that allows for such a variety of, of classes and, and mixing and matching of abilities. Um, it's super awesome. Probably one of the better game systems I've ever read about in a lit RPG story. Huge fan. Would recommend in this series to anybody. Um, this story gets an 8 out of 10 for me. So there you go. Okay, uh, last but not least... We have books 13 and 14 in the Reborn, um, I guess, serial series. 
it's been a really long time since we've gotten books from the author written by D.W. Jackson. Okay, um, two summaries for this. We have um, in book 13, Demon's Trap, I'll just read what the author wrote. The demon army is marching, and the entire kingdom of Hoverilia is on guard. Ash had never thought himself a hero, but now he was far from that, as one could come as the demon army marched behind him. The deaths he had seen haunted his dream, but what awaited him at his destination was far worse than even his dreams. Okay, uh, in book 14, that author's summary or the description of the novel, Ash is trying to make his way home, but not everything is as easy as it sounds. The goddess walks next to him, but in the world of men, her beauty is destined to cause trouble. As his enemies increase, Ash must make it back home to where his family awaits him. Okay. Um, my opinion. Uh, books 13 is 83 pages. Books 14 is 74 pages. Each of them is $2.99, which is kind of a high price tag. Neither one of them is available on Kindle Unlimited. Now, for newcomers who have never heard of this series, don't start here. These two books, uh, I couldn't really recommend, I, in good conscience anyways. They're, they're really expensive. There's not a lot of action. The story is, is really just wrapping things up for the author. Um, so you're not going to get a lot of the great goodness that you would uh, uh, that you would in the very begin as you would in the beginning of the series. Um, again, as far as like a price point, you're paying like three cents a page, and that to me is way too much. Um, and there's a lot of spelling and grammar errors. So uh, for anybody who's thinking about picking these up who's never read the earlier portions, uh, please don't. I mean, I like them personally. So I'll, I'll say it two ways. Um, if you've never read the series, go to the beginning. And you can see if you like them or not. Um, but don't start here. This is not a place. This this is the roughest of, of all the books. Um, so I can't recommend it for anybody who's new. But for me personally, um, I purchased all these books. I purchased all 14, full price tag. Um, and I was happy to do so. Uh, I, I was happy to return to this series and to see a real final ending to it. It's not ambiguous. You know, so it's, it's a definite ending to the series uh, and and personally um, I use this as a, an example of a good little RPG serial it has issues I'm not saying it doesn't um, especially ha after the halfway point in the series but in the beginning it does a really good job of establishing game rules and setting up an interesting story and kind of getting into the action in a very short amount of time and I think that's a really good example to send for other lit RPG authors who are considering doing series because they're challenging I talked about that in the last episode on a little Ramon soapbox a um, little bit, but it's, you know, this is a good example, at least in the very beginning of it. I've read and reread the first four or five books in this series probably a dozen times. Um, and it was definitely one of my go-to reads in, in the time period where there wasn't a lot of literary stories. This, those first four or five books were definitely the ones that I thought, okay, these, these are definitely rereadable for, you know, a dozen times at least. Um, now, back into the review portion of these particular stories, uh, starting with book 14, um, sorry, book 13, Demon's Trap. Again, lots of typos, lots of grammar issues, and there's a lot of introspection. Like, you, you will hear about the author's, uh, the main character, Ash's dreams, like, three or four times in the very short, you know, there's not a lot of pages. Um, I, I, I got the point the first time. Um, and additionally, this happens several times in the series where the author kind of wants to reset things. And he just kidnaps the main character. Um, the first time it happened was by the demon horde. And this time it's by a bunch of um, mages who created the demons. And they want to study him and dissect him and torture him to get mysteries of how to cross the plains or something. It's weird, but again, I was happy to read these final two books, personally. Okay, um, in book 14, this I'm calling Ash and Attila's Travel Log. Because that's all they really do. The goddess Attila... Um, comes down from heaven and she hangs out at, with Ash at, in a mortal form and he takes her as a wife. Um, there's a little bit of love flirting thing. Um, one of the things I didn't care for in the particular ser um, last book was that they kind of blamed her for being pretty for a lot of the problems that were caused with other dudes like kings and princesses, kings and princes rather, um, wanted to take her to bed and they kind of ordered her to do so when she refused you know, they brought out guards to try to take her by force. Uh, but the story always kind of points that as she's so pretty, it's, you know, natural to happen. You know, beauty causes problems, basically. And, you know, it's a little 
bit of a stretch and I don't agree with that particular viewpoint of the you know beautiful woman but you know it is what it is um again there are no cliffhangers to this series it's an actual ending um but you can kind of tell within these last two books that the author might have planned to do a lot of other things with the series but apparently he's been having a lot of health issues and he just decided to wrap things up so he can start new projects potentially so that's it um i again happy to see the series end unambiguously and for me again it was just a matter of like getting a conclusion for these stories for me reading these last two books was like what uh, watching the last season of friends if you've ever seen that television show you probably know what i mean really good series but that last season was just like a little cringeworthy sometimes and you can tell that they were stretching things out and that the actors didn't really want to be there anymore but the money was too good to say no to a last season but that really didn't stop you from enjoying that last episode and getting that sense of conclusion from that very last goodbye episode of that series. And this is kind of the same way it is for me. I wouldn't recommend it to anybody to, to read on their own unless you're already a big fan of the series. Um, but it, it does give me at least a, a sense of conclusion. But again, I, I would recommend if you're thinking about starting the series or reading it, go to the beginning, get a sample. I think the first book is on Kindle Unlimited. I, I could be mistaken. It goes off and on. Um, but again, the first three, four books, really cool. I liked them a lot. Um, so there you go. But these last two were just like, I rated them a five out of 10. So there you go. It's a, it's an ending now. So that's it. That's it. We're done everyone. Yeah, it's a long podcast, eight books. That's a lot of stuff to review. Um, if you enjoy the podcast, you want to support us, you can of course like us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, um, we'll have the links in the show notes for you guys. Um, you can find all the way, other ways to support the podcast at liprbdpodcast.com forward slash support. That's it. Thank you everyone for listening to me talk about something that I geek out about and I love Litter PG. So again, until we can hang out and, and, and discuss these things again, folks, remember, go read some Litter RPG. Goodbye, everybody.